Welcome, ladies and germs. Yes, germs. We were talking about you. That is our new name for gentlemen because, well, frankly, we don't really know the term. Of, we don't know what the definition of gentleman is anymore. Yeah. They're taking that from us. But anyway, enough about that shit. This hmm. here is the Bunny Rabbit Hole. And what we do here at the Bunny Rabbit Hole is each and every week we pick one central theme picked by either myself, Jason, or my co-host, Craig. Yes. We pick a theme, and then we explore that theme until something inspires us to talk about something completely different. And then we talk about that for a little bit until Craig loses patience, or we run out of time when we have to come back to the main theme. Right. And as Jason said, we pick a central topic, and we research it for the week, and we'll research both sides, not just what fits our narrative. And this, it, then we also include our opinions. And this is for entertainment. If you're easily offended, now's the time to go find something else to do because our opinions can get pretty dark and harsh at times. <laughs> right. Just like opinions are supposed to. Because they're opinions. Right. right. All right. So, like he said, we researched both sides. And now you're going to hear both sides of it because, well, there's two sides to every story. And then there's an edge to those stories. And then, you know, two sides to a coin, edge to a coin. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. What the hell are we talking about today, Craig? Today, we are talking about, dun, 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 urban legends, or as when we were kids, they were called old wives tales. Yeah, and we're not going to talk about the band. We'll maybe roughly reference the movie that came out in 98, but we're going to talk about what is an urban legend, why are they legends, are they, you know, talk about the myths and the folklore and all that inspiring stuff to talk about urban legends now this is something that we growing up we used to go uh camping <laughs> and i remember one particular camping trip it was your dad my dad your brother my brother went camping at what mud lake i think it was yeah when we were young and your dad and my dad used to were, were telling like spooky uh scary st uh, stories to us you know we were young I was really, really young because, you know, I'm almost four years younger than Matt and where the book ends here. So there was, a, there was an age gap when you get really young like that, when you're, you're four, four yeah. to eight, there's a big age, there's a big difference in what you should be comprehending at that time. Well, they tell us the story, wait till we kind of fall asleep. They start scratching the tent in the middle of the night. We all take off running. We'll right. Out into, the wit, out into the woods, which... In hindsight, it's not the best thing to do from four to eight-year-olds having to just run <laughs> wherever out into the woods. Right. But some of those, those stories I still think about today because one of them, obviously, is the, probably the most well-known one is the man with the hook in his hand. Right. And it, there's like a couple different versions of it. It's either he's got a hook in his hand or the boyfriend goes out to get help, and then it's his hand scratching the top of the roof as he's hung upside down dead. Yeah. Or then there's the, they take uh, the, the man's, or something was scaring him, and when they arrive at their destination, there's a hook in the door. Right. You know, and they always, there's always an escape mental patient. Yes. You know, the Mike, uh, Mike Myers of the right. whole thing. You know, both Wayne and the killer from the Halloween movies. Right. Well, I mean, that's that's probably the most popular one is the whole hook thing. Everybody's heard it. That's that, mm -hmm. that's why we're not going into detail on it. But the other, I think, would be the other second most popular one would be alligators in the sewers. Yeah, yes. I mean, that was that was um, so bad that they actually created there was a made for TV movie in the eighties. I think it was just simply called Alligator where uh, a boy gets an alligator as a pet. His dad gets mad at him and flushes the alligator down the toilet. Then next thing you know, sewer workers are being ripped apart by a 20-foot alligator. Right. Well, and, you know, there was um, a newspaper mm -hmm. paper article in 1935 about the alligators and sewers, where they actually, the mayor at the time, because back then they could buy those mm -hmm. as, and try to keep them as pets, whereas, you know, the laws and regulations on that have changed, so people can't buy alligators as pets anymore. Yeah. So they, they found them, but they only grew to like two feet. Yeah, it, right. Um, but so now we're these are stories that 
have throughout generations have, you know, somebody told that story to somebody and then somebody else told that the story to somebody else. They've added to it. They embellished. And the next thing you know, that little, that little, um, we'll, we'll call it a lie. Right. Grows into something that becomes myth or folklore. Right. It, it just takes a life of its own. And next thing you know, there's made for TV movies about it. There's specials about it. People are still scared to go into the sewers. Because of that, people are scared to go to Lover's Lane or out, out into the um, deep forest with with your your partner. But um, so, kind of what I wanted to talk about really quick was kind of like, um, what is an urban legend and what, why you know why they become there? And I want to give an example of a of a contemporary one that has grown into something though, so we can kind of see it happen in real time. So like. Uh, the term urban legend actually was coined, was um, first used by folklorists in uh, 1968. And uh, there was Jean Har Harold Brunvand. He was a professor of English at the University of Utah. Introduced the term into the general uh, public in a series of popular books that he had in 1981. He used it right. earlier, but he had a, had a series of books in 81. Uh, there was the ones of The Vanishing Hitchhiker. Uh, an urban let American urban legends and their meetings. Uh, the vanishing hitchhiker is another popular one where people pick up a hitchhiker and then he's nowhere to be found. He, he gets right. in the backseat of the car and then they, he tells them this story. And then before the, before too long, the, the hitchhikers just gone, vanished. And this right. is more than just in Utah. It's happened in various places around the country. Yeah. But, well, you know, like I said, you know, when we were kids, they were called old wise tales. And it's basically, they were, their stories created to invoke fear. And they're usually, nine times out of 10, they're centered on a damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, it's always, you know, the whole, oh, female victim. It's usually like college age girls or something. It goes out to college and they're, you know, heard, heard, heard a psychic on TV saying, oh, I saw this, it's a Big Ten school, and the, there's going to be somebody slaughtered, and da-da-da, yes. and, and then somebody gets killed, and, you know, but it's, but there's no proof, there's no actual story to back it up. It, right, it's like, I heard this happen at this school at that time, and then when you go to that school, they say, no, I heard it happen at this school, and um, generally, they have some sort of morality uh, yeah. Net, uh, cause or um, I don't. What's the word I'm looking for? At, at the height of it, in the middle of it, there's some kind of uh, deep moral thing. It's like, should you be a, if you're if you're with your you know a boyfriend or girlfriend or making out a lover's lane in, in a passenger seat, and you know the the psycho attacks them. The morality there is you probably shouldn't be up at lover's lane because you're going to be attacked by a crazy lunatic that's escaped from the same asylum. Right. It's, it's just, it's just like all the horror movies don't have sex or you're going to die. Right. It, exactly. And it also, it, just like the horror films, uh, if you're a woman, you're going to be the last one alive. Right. If you're a white right. girl, you're going to be the one that survives. Yep. You're the only, you'll be the sole <laughs> survivor. <laughs> exactly. But so I kind of wanted to talk about how one of these things actually grows. And there's okay. one that's that's, uh, that's happened just recently, like within the last 10, 12 years, that's grown a life of its own. And that is, uh, it's Slender Man. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. So Slender Man started as a Photoshop contest on a website called Something Awful. What it was, was uh, you're supposed to come up with, if I remember correctly, I'm doing this from my horrible memory, but uh, it was a make a scary a photo that was uh, an old timey photo that looks scary. And what it was is this guy created these uh, images of this tall man with long arms, no face, wearing a suit, kind of like Angus Grimm from uh, the, the Phantasm movies. Right. But he's off in the distance and he's always around children. He got created a whole, a whole series of them. But then people started creating more of them that he, that he didn't do it. So kind of after, after his creation, it kind of got a little bit of life of its own. Then right. 
after that, people started writing creepy pastas about Slender Man and started giving him more and more of a backstory. Before, he was just an image in a picture, and the, he, the guy gave him a name. But then through time, people started writing more and more creepy pastas. People started writing uh, so accounts to a website started to appear. And then I think it finally cult or you know, that kind of hit its crescendo when two little girls in Wisconsin tried to kill another little girl in the name of Slender Man. Did now, she deserve it? What's that? No, she did not deserve it. Oh, okay. I had to ask. They were, they were trying to sacrifice this girl to Slender Man to show their worthiness. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what all this really, uh, so from this one fir very first Photoshop image to an actual physical crime that happened, or it became a folk, it became a legend. It was just a, not, it was just a, an image, then it became a story, then it became a legend. Then it became, you know, folklore. Then it became truth. So it actually created what, what's called in a, uh, a Native American have a term for it. It's called a tulpa. Okay. Now, what a tulpa is, is if you start thinking about a creature, say like they start giving, uh, they start talking about the Wendigo. And next thing you know, they start, you know, this person's talking about, this person's talking about, it, and they're giving the idea of the Wendigo uh, energy. Then from right thoughts the wendigo becomes real right and that's kind of what happened with slender man now well, is there actually a tall man out there that's got these creepy arms that kills kids no but when the little girls brought it to reality by trying to kill another kid it actually almost became a, a, a something real life right well and you know oh uh, shit what was i gonna say <laughs> um Fuck. We're so we're talking Slender Man. Yep. We're talking about oh, Tolkien. It's, it's it's similar to you know how religions are created. Yeah. You know, like you know Scientology and stuff like that. It's like you come up with this idea, you start spreading the idea, you give the idea some wings, people start believing in it. All of a sudden, you have a religion that you've created out of nothing. Now you have a whole bunch of people that believe in the same ideas there and then you through that it's given life right now, there's a lot of these that aren't even close to the level of of slender man i just wanted to use that one as an example because right it started off as something innocent and kind of fun on a on a website you know just a photoshop contest and then became the near tragic death of a little girl who was stabbed 19 times by her friends and she fucking lived yeah yeah to talk about the spirit Shit, there's gonna be some severe PTSD out of that one. Yeah, it, exactly. And they were they were young too. They were like 12 and 13 years old or something yeah. like that. So, well, you know, and we, we talk about when we talk about these things, you know, like I said, old wives' tales. I can't, and they have the whole moral structure and whatever. It's kind of like you know what Grandma used to say to us when we were kids: "Don't play with fire, you'll pee the bed." <laughs> Because there's always, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. Right. Even though that one made absolutely no sense, but. Nope, but I loved it. <laughs> but it, it, you know, those times when I didn't play with fire because, you know what, I didn't want wet sheets. Right. Or I knew somebody was spending the night, so. Right. So when I was doing my, my research on this, mm -hmm. I wanted to go a different route instead of all these ones that everybody's heard about. Right. So I went and I found one that was based off a video game. Oh, cool. And um, the video game was Zelda Majora's Mask. Mm -hmm. And this guy um, wants this game. So he finally finds a version of it online, um, orders it. It comes in the mail. And it was like off eBay or something like that. It was from a private seller. And when he gets the cartridge, just like for like – a Nintendo. It's one of those gray cartridges, you know, yeah. that they used to have the sticker artwork on. Well, this had no artwork on it. It just said Majora across it in like Sharpie. So he he puts in he puts the game in, loads it up, and notices that there is a save file titled Ben from the previous owner. Mm. So 
he um he deletes the save file because you know he doesn't need it he's gonna play the game himself so he starts after he deletes it he starts playing the game and all the npcs in the game are calling him ben even though it's a new game he's got a different character name they're oh. all calling him ben so he's getting a little bit freaked out about it so he turns it off he comes back to it a couple days later and the save file Ben is back, but there's also another save file called Drowned. And now, when he's playing the game, he gets followed around by this creepy statue that has bleeding eyes, and it's following Link around everywhere. And he just keep and Link just keeps dying over and over and over. And after every death, a text would come up saying, "You've met a terrible fate, haven't you?" And you know this was this guy posts all this stuff on this 4chan on that 4chan channel, mm -hmm. but it was just it was just eerie. He's like the thing would just keep popping up and popping up and follow him everywhere. He couldn't play the game at all. His character would just keep dying over and over again. Weird. Yeah. Huh. But again, don't know if it's true, but it's interesting. It, exactly. Exactly. No, that's a fun one. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I wanted to try going somewhere different with it for once. So, <laughs> I do have another one. I do have one that's a little different. It's actually two that are kind of combined, but they're kind of in the same same genre. The first one is I don't know if you really remember in the height of the internet when people were starting. Uh, hotmail was huge back then. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a hotmail account. And right. once or twice a week, you would get an email that says, Bill Gates wants to try something, and he's going to donate $100 to charity for every time that he sees this is forwarded. Right. So you, would for, you would forward that to your friends, and then your friends would forward it to them. And supposedly, when it all said and done, Bill Gates was going to give this huge lump sum of charity to money to charity. Right. Okay. Now... The fun part about this one was there was it was the the part that I like in a lot of these is just like I like in conspiracy theories is there's a little bit of truth mm -hmm. it brings in a a little bit of um uh conversation of oh, believability too yes. because there's a little bit of truth mixed into it so it makes it a little bit more believable so it's a microsoft product and mm -hmm. obviously Bill Gates is in, in charge of that with Hotmail being Microsoft. Well, the the big argument that most people had against this was the fact that it's like you can't track this. You can't track right. how many times it's being forwarded, all this. Well, it can be tracked, and it was tracked, but not for the reason that you were thinking. It wasn't Bill Gates that was sending these around. It was phishing scams trying to gain as many email addresses so that they could – they could spam to so fill up that, that folder that you hate. So mm -hmm. you them. What they do is a little thing called a one pixel by one pixel image. And people still do this today. So be very careful of anything that you open from in your spam folder. When you, a person can add a one pixel by one pixel image, which obviously you can't see when you open this up, but the image is host somewhere else. So every time that that image is loaded, when you when you open the email, it tells their Google Analytics that hey, this email address just opened up that image, and voila, now they have your your email address. Back then, they couldn't actually pull too much from from that, but with with Google, they can actually with Gmail, they can actually get your name, your email address, and some other personal information. Your phone number, because a lot of people use their phone number as a backup. Exactly. So they can get all this stuff. So the, it was it was it was a cool story about Bill Gates going to help people, but in reality, it was far spookier because now your information is being gathered by somebody that you didn't know. Not right. Bill Gates. But then the other one is this. It's kind of along the same lines as uh, there's there's an app that goes around that people say, and you, and I still see ads for it all the time. It's like, check out who's been, who's been viewing your Facebook profile. <laughs> okay. This app doesn't work. Okay. So it, 
what it what it really does is when you click on it, you're not going to be able to find out who's been looking at your Facebook page. They're getting access to your Facebook page because right. you go there, you sign in as your Facebook page, and then voila, now they have they have access to your entire your entire profile and all your friends and everything yeah. else. So part of uh, like I like your story. Your story was uh, I mean that was cool. That was the that was cool, but right. a lot of with uh, with urban legend stuff, it's kind of uh, the, the the reality is it's a, you're thinking this, but really it's far worse than what it really could have been. Right. Well, and I mean, like all these chain mails, you you have to forward this on, or you'll have bad luck for the rest of your life. Well, you know what? I'm okay with bad luck. I guess. Can the bad luck be worse than it already is? Right. <laughs> hey, I got a question for you. Yes. Do you want to know what the creepiest urgent urban legend for your state is? Oh, yeah, I want to. Yeah. It's the thirteen steps to hell. Oh, yeah. It's um, but you can't go to it now, though, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So why it's creepy? It's basically the opposite of the Zeppelin song, the Multi Cemetery. And I'm pulling all of this off a website called Thrillist.com. Uh huh. The Maltbury Cemetery itself, the subject of rumors associating it with Satanism, is rumored to include a subterranean tomb for a really creepy rich family. I think we talked about this in a different podcast. We that did. Could be, yeah, that could be accessed by 13 steps that led to their final resting place, or the final resting place of every damn soul in history. As legend has it, that descending the entire staircase led you to glimpse hell itself. <laughs> and here's where it came from. The cemetery has been around since 1901. Through the crypt itself, the date has been lost to time as have the stairs themselves, which have been bulldozed and covered in concrete. That hasn't stopped curious paranormal masochists from trespassing on the secluded private property, allegedly showing up at the cemetery at night, eager to unearth it via nocturnal excavation missions and being greeted by the cemetery's other apparition. <laughs> that's, that's, a, I wish, I wish it was still there. Yeah. I wish you could go see that because that would have been a great day drive. Yep. Oh, that. Yeah, we talked about that one during our um, the scariest places yeah. in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our scariest places. Uh, along those lines, though, because you brought up Zeppelin, is another cool, cool one uh, is the Black Dog. Now, urban legend. The right. Black Dog was game was given to a name primarily found in folklores in Britain and Ireland, but the Black Dog essentially was a nocturnal apparition often said to be associated with the devil or the hellhound. His appearance was regarded as, to, as portent of death and is generally supposed to be larger than a normal dog and often has large glowing eyes. It is associated with electrical storms such as uh, the Black Shuck's appearance in uh, uh, Bungay, Suffolk, which I have that one here in a minute. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and also with the crossroads, places of execution and, and ancient pathways. But it's also said that the black if you see the black dog, death will will follow you. If if the black dog appears to you, you will die within it's kind of like the the watching the ring videotape. You'll die yeah. in seven days. Yeah, I I'm sorry, but if I saw a dog with glowing fucking eyes, I'd be running the fuck out. Yep, check please. Yep. I'm out. Peace. Yeah. Oh <laughs> there's no Hey puppy! No, there's not. Right. Um, I mean, that's, just, that's the problem is because people are so stupid that they would do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Why, are doggies? <laughs> Why is it eating my soul? <laughs> so, I, I mentioned the black shuck. Black shuck, old shuck, um, old shuck, or simply shuck is a name given to a, a ghostly apparition that uh, is along the coast of uh, Suffolk and Ireland. And stuff. It's just another another big big black dog that just haunts the coastline, but this one's uh, more ghostly than right. than the hellhound itself. Right. Um, do you want to know what the scariest urban legend from Michigan is? Absolutely. Hell's Bridge. Oh, why it's creepy. The name Rouge and Dogman. They've got nothing on the tails of Elias Frisk. I think we talked about this one too. <laughs> A deranged old preacher who, according to blood-curdling lore, pied-pipered a group of tethered children into the woods near what is now oh, yeah. Angoma Township. 
He slaughtered them one by one, cast them into Cedar Creek before being caught by their parents and hanged. But not before saying he was possessed by demons. In its current form, Hell's Bridge is a creaky, narrow metal footbridge in the middle of the woods where those brave enough to cross at night claim to hear voices and screams of children and are sometimes greeted by a black figure with glowing eyes as they traverse it. Hey, more glowing eyes. Where it came from, there is no record of an Elias Frisky in the area, though there was a prominent Frisky family beginning in the 1910s. Still, despite the lack of hard facts, anyone who's visited the bridge will attest that there's something out there that usually makes its presence known as you're teetering on a shaky metal bridge in the moonlight. <laughs> Why the fuck? Would you go out there in the moonlight on a bridge? Um, that's metal. No, no. Yeah, it's but I mean, you mentioned it before too, because the the dog man. Yeah, you definitely don't go out in full moon into the woods on a you know a a place you can't escape from. That's called Hell's Bridge. <laughs> right. Is it anywhere near Hell, Michigan? I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah, it was in Algoma Township, and I think that's in the UP. Okay, but, but I still you want know, to go. I I don't I don't think he's getting any more babysitting jobs after that. No, uh, what is that? Care dot com that has like uh, babysitting. Right. Uh, thing you can. <laughs> we were watching that commercial the other day. It was, it, it they they have all kinds of different things like vets and doctors and all this other stuff, house right. and stuff. But then there's babysitters on there. And this lady's going through, oh, and she's so highly rated. And then we I just had to add in there. And my husband loves her too. And <laughs> well, and you know, um, these are the ones that I like are the medical urban legends. Mm. Like, oh, I went out to a strange place, had a few drinks, somebody roofied me. I woke up in the morning with this, my side hurt and a sticky note right up by my head that says, Call 911, I removed your kidney. Yeah, you wake up in a bathtub full of ice. Yeah. And and this one has gained a lot of notoriety, too, because uh, Law & Order did an episode on it. Mm-hmm. And it was in Jay and Silent Bob. There was a, there was a, a in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, there was a little cut, a throwaway scene where Jay talks about getting his kidney removed while he's, right. while he's roofied. <laughs> but, yeah, and then there's always, like, I mean, Another one would we talk about in the Halloween one was you know the razor blades and apples and shit and the Halloween candy. Yeah. So yeah, we we did a long bit on this one and it's not true um, because the oh there's only been one person in the United States history that's ever been convicted of harming a child via candy on Halloween and he turned out to be the stepdad or the father. That right, own kids. Right. Uh, I remember this one because Grandma used to say this one too. Um, one of the things that they used to tell us is if you ate the watermelon seeds or apple seeds or any fruit seeds, that fruit would grow inside your belly. Mm-hmm. Grandma used to tell us that too. Yep. And or, or you know, say that when she was pregnant with my sisters. She, I ate yeah. some watermelon seeds and I'm like, fuck that, I'm not at all. Well, and it's like the whole, you know, don't go swimming half hour after until a half hour after you eat and all that shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah I remember uh, we were kids and we were at your dad's house. I think I we were, we we're in the pool there and Aunt Denise would not let us jump in there because until 45 minutes after we ate lunch. And right. Really? I had a Dixie cup full of mac and cheese. I highly doubt I'm going to die. Right, <laughs> but but there's a lot of fun. And there's, there's a lot of fun urban legends too. Oh, well, the other thing. Especially to. Don't do it. There you go. Hey, you're back. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was bad. Yeah. Well, and you know. With urban legends now, they can they can gain so much traction and they can they grow so much faster because of the advent of the internet, social media, all that stuff. I mean, that's you know, it, it, somebody will create something and it'll go viral, you know, mm-hmm. like Slenderman and shit like that. Right. You know, it that you can come up with something, you just start 
and it just include bits of truth and you can put it out there on Facebook or you can put it out there on Twitter and somebody's going to bite onto that little sliver of truth and think the whole thing is real. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a couple more internet ones that I kind of wanted to talk about or internet urban legends. Um, some of them deal with the deep web or the dark web. Mm-hmm. So the dark web is this infamous place where drugs and people and guns and missiles and anything you want. It's a lawless part of the internet, which is, it's true. Those, those sites do exist. I'm not saying they don't, but the, you need to know the difference between just the dark web, the deep web and all this. The internet is essentially everything or what we, we refer to as the internet is everything that's indexed by a search engine. Okay. Then, then they say you, generally that's like 10% of the internet. It's like the top of the iceberg that you see out of the water. Then the, the rest of it is, you know, the dark web, the deep web. Now, mm-hmm. most of these pages are pages that you go to every single day. Anytime you log into your bank account, you log into your Facebook account, anytime that you log into something, that page that you use to log in is not indexed in a search engine. So technically, you're in the dark web. Ah! So most of the time you go to one of these pages by yourself. Now, there are these bad sites that you, people, parents worry about. It's like, oh, my, my kid's going to go find this, these, these dark web sites, you know, to go buy drugs, whatever. But you have to use special things to get to them. One is you have to use the search engine Tor. Tor is a, it's the onion, um, oh, what is it called? Onion repository? Yeah, something like that. Anyway, uh, these websites, uh, like the Silk Road was the most famous one. It was a website where you could buy a whole bunch of drugs. You could buy drugs. It was a drug superstore, but you could only buy them if you if you had tons of Bitcoin and you had the, the tour and you knew how to get there because these websites aren't dot coms, they're dot onions, and they're not just like, the Silk Road was not just Silk Road dot onion, it's like A dash four, three, uppercase Z, you know, it's, it's a string of characters with a dot onion, so they're hard to get to. Right. But on there, they're said to be places called a red room. Now, if you don't know what a red room is, red room is a, is a mythical website that you can go and actually watch peop- live people be tortured to death. It's basically watching the movie Hostel. The, the torture scenes of Hostel where you're directing these people what to do to the person that's being tortured. Now, don't know if they, they, they really exist. People claim they exist, but then it's illegal to even go to a site like this or if it's in your search engine, search engine history you can go to prison for being there so there's nobody that's really stepping up and say that they've been to these sites the real right. the real danger though is there there could be sites out there like that the problem with fi- trying to find these sites and I'm, this is a huge warning part about about this is especially for your children if they do go to use the onion and try to get not the onion the tor onion browser and try to find these sites the the danger is a lot of these sites have child porn on them if they open up on your computer then technically you just involve yourself in child pornography yep that is the danger of trying to find these sites so don't educate your kids to stay away from these sites educate them on what could happen if they found the wrong site right well, not only that is, let's be realistic. Wherever you go on the internet, somebody somebody's watching. Oh, absolutely. So they know everywhere you're going. You know, and the whole big brother, you know, George Orwell was a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> right. You yeah. know, Google's never erased a search that you've ever done. Yeah, you can tell that just when you go to Google and you just type in one letter and everything you search for by that letter pops up. <laughs> right. So, but, so there's, there's a lot of these like deep web um, urban legends that are out there too. I, 
I'm begging you not to try to find them because it's illegal just to open up one of those websites. Well, it's just stupid too. And yeah, that too. Now there's some that were thought to be urban legend that turned out to be true. There's, so there's, there's a, a an infamous 4chan video, a video that was posted on 4chan. It's called two men, one ice pick. Now, what this is, is I'm going to leave the names out of it because I, I, I might butcher them. There was a Chinese um, national who was a college student in, in Canada and then a Canadian citizen who lured this, this uh, Chinese man to his room, ties him up, sp- supposedly uh, bonded, se- you know, uh, bonded sex between the two of them. He ties the guy up and starts stabbing him with an ice pick. Then, right. then cuts him, cuts him to pieces, and then plays with the pieces, all in video. Yeah. This video turned out to be true because the guy was convicted. Convicted, and there are still some sites like I might be on Best Gore. So there's a couple of those websites out there that have it. There's another one of these videos out there that's called uh, uh, Three Men One Hammer" or Three Psychos One Hammer." Yeah, where. A one guy videotapes, uses a cell phone to to tape the other guy beating a guy to death with a hammer. Those kids were ultimately they were Russian kids, and they were they were arrested. But those are some videos that were urban led that were thought to <coughs> be fake at first, and then turned out to be to to be real. Right. Now, um, well, and you know, most urban legends are based off. You know, like we said, you know, a little bit of truth, but a lot of them, like, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Knock Knock Road in Detroit. Uh Uh-uh. Okay. So, the Knock Knock Road, okay, here it is. All right. You're driving down Starsburg Street in Detroit on a warm night. It's 2 a.m., and as you approach a stop sign, you notice how desolate and quiet everything is. You glance to your left and see a small girl standing on the sidewalk, where he sets in a little bit of uneasiness as she stares at you. Something doesn't feel right about her. Why is she out this late at night and all alone? You look away from her and are suddenly startled by a loud, loud knock, knock on your driver's side window. A little girl standing, standing there looking at you with sad, deep set, hollow eyes. She's looking for the driver who killed her. Oh. But a lot of these stories, a lot of these urban legends get their start on some random accident that happened to somebody. Mm-hmm. And elevated. Yeah. See, and that one almost reminds me of, like the Black Eyed Children, right? Which is is another uh, urban legend where these kids with just they look normal with just solid black eyes will latch onto you and they'll try to get get you to give do them favors, do them right, favors. and then ultimately it's like lets you into their they want you to let them into their your home or your car, and then that's when they have their their way with you right right and i mean and you know it's just in any story you hear you got to take with a grain of salt i mean it's so easy anymore to actually do you know take you know five minutes and research it and find out that it's false yeah and there's there's like factcheck.org that it's got a lot of these that you can go and check yeah, that's the site. I know they do a lot of political, but they have some. Or they have an urban legends part too. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of these that aren't really dark and macabre too. There's some fun ones, right? Like uh, years ago, there was it was given a Darwin Award before the person was uh, it was proven false, and then they actually did it on MythBusters to see if it could actually happen. It's the one where. The guy had a, like a, a 68, a 69 Impala or 63 Impala and straps a Jado rocket to the top of it mm. and uh, goes, it was in uh, <laughs> uh, Arizona and supposedly how the story goes is the person hits the straightaway, hits that, hits that Jado rocket, the car propels from doing 80 miles an hour to 100 or 170 miles an hour and then then just keeps climbing from there the dude driving hits the brakes on the car to try to slow down but at that speed the brakes just melted instantaneously 
shortly before it hit a bump and then takes flight. And then the the police officers find a black dart uh, dart on the side of a cliffside, you know, fifty feet up in the air, and they finally uh, identified the driver's that driver by the teeth that were left behind there through dental records. <laughs> it's a great story. Yep. Unfortunately, it's not true, and MythBusters proved that they couldn't even get the car going that much faster with the Jado rocket. Right. Well, here's one for you too. Um, Okay, so doing my research, I watched this TV series that I found on YouTube from sometime in the, between 1995 and 2011. It was actually called Urban Legends. Uh-huh. Is this um, the, uh, Truth or Fantasy, or is this the other one? There's two, there were two of them. I don't know. It had Natasha Henstridge as the host. Okay. Um, and, like... So this guy's out in his garage. He's working on his lawnmower. He's just getting really frustrated with it. He can't figure out what's wrong with it. And, you know, he's got oil and gas that leaked out to it, out of it. It's on the floor. His wife comes in and asks him to go do something, and she's frustrated because she sees the mess. So she soaks up, grabs a towel, soaks up the, the gas and oil, then takes it into the bathroom and wrings it out in the toilet. Mm -hmm. So the guy... You know, after he does what his wife asks him, goes and sits down on the toilet because he's got, you know, business to take care of. And he's sitting there thinking about the whole lawnmower thing, trying to figure out how to fix it. And at that point, he decides, yeah, you know what? I need a cigarette. So he takes out a cigarette, lights it up, puffing away, still thinking about the lawnmower, then tosses the cigarette in the toilet, and it explodes! <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh... Yeah, that never really happened. But it's again another. It's one of those one from that TV show, and it's just. And the cool thing about TV shows is afterwards, after they tell you the story, they go back and they, you know, bring on some specialist who says, "Oh, this could happen," or "Yeah, this couldn't happen." Oh, um, nice. In this one, they actually took a toilet out into the, like, you know, like a gravel pit somewhere, and put a dummy mannequin dummy on it, and like. You know, the dude, the one they have on Mythbusters. But, <laughs> yep. And then they put half a stick of dynamite in it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and they blew it up and it just shot straight up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> so then they decided to use a whole stick of dynamite. Oh. And, it, and when they did the whole stick of dynamite, it just, they, it just tore it apart to shreds. There was pieces of it everywhere. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's so, not. But you know, you know, when we were younger, though, I, our parents always had ashtrays in the bathroom. They'd always smoke in the bathroom. Yeah. While they're sitting on the toilet, I never got. I mean, I'm a smoker, but I never really got into smoking on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Too much methane gas. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so I mean, there's. So many stories like that on that. It, it's an interesting show. Horrible acting. Right. Horrible acting. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's worth it's worth a check out. It's on, like I said, it's on it's on um, YouTube. You can check. It another out. another good one too is uh, there's a group. Uh, there's three documentaries by the same people. The first one that they did is called Cropsy, where it's essentially. Um, the escaped lunatic um, ends up stealing a bunch of kids and murdering them. Right. This is a Long Island specific thing, but they in in this they find out that there's multiple different um, versions of the same Cropsy story throughout the country. So they go in and they investigate the regional versions of the same the same story. Now their Cropsy story was a little bit more real because it well it was real. Right, the man. That was uh, that was a custodian from the um, from this um, home for uh, uh, orphaned children that was in fact killing kids. So right. that's the basis of their legend. But that legend from there spawned to other places, and they it grew their own. But then they do have an actual urban legend show, and then they have another one called Hellier, which is really cool. It's about a small town in Kentucky. That's got 
a creature and they go to oh. investigate it that's running around. So, but look up those three documentaries, especially the Cropsey and the, and the urban legends one, because they're, they're phenomenally well done. And I'm not going to go into the urban legends that they do within it, within their shows, because I want you to see them for, you know, give them some promotion for that, but they're really well done. Right. Yeah. You know, there's not to mention that there are so many websites just, dedicated like this thrillist i mean it's got the urban legend the creepiest urban legend in every state mm. you know like florida is the skunk ape you know which we talked about that in the our bigfoot episodes arizona's the skinwalkers we talked about that about them yeah a lot of stuff that is stuff that we've covered at one point or another <laughs> yeah. uh and so many oh hawaii you want to know what hawaii's is what the night marchers that just sounds ominous doesn't it it does like oh the night watchers be careful where you go okay why it's creepy picture yourself on a scenic hawaiian beach at night imagine a full moon and a cool breeze running across the sand dreamy but if you hear the faint sounds of drums pounding in the distance or you see a barrage of torches out on the horizon it could be your worst nightmare these spirits of ancient Hawaiian warriors dedicated to protecting the islands from all outside threats will only spare your life if you reportedly lay face down, pee on yourself in submission, or miraculously share a bloodline with one of the warriors. Good luck peeing on yourself, tourists. <laughs> Where it came from. The first alleged encounter with the night marcher, marches known as Wakulapu in Hawaiian was recorded when Captain Cook arrived on Hawaiian shores in 1778 in Hawaiian tradition, the night marchers' role in life was to protect sacred members of the community. In modern times, their spirits have been reported all throughout the islands, mainly at the sites of sacrificial temples and other sacred grounds. Oh, in the decidedly corporate Davies Pacific Center building in downtown Honolulu. Apparently, they still protect the island from outsiders. Maybe buy into the legend, they always will. Oh. Kind of cool, though. It, yeah. I, I, if I hear drums and see torches, I'm not going to pee on myself and I'm not going to lay face down. It's just not happening. No, no. I I might pee on myself, but maybe for right. other reasons. Right. <laughs> That's what my wife just said, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, there's lots of interesting ones from every, every state. Now, some that I've actually liked are like the pop culture ones. Mm -hmm. The pop culture ones. Like, one of the most most uh, notable ones is Paul is dead. Paul McCartney was died off in nineteen in nineteen sixty six, and then it's a imposter that's played Paul ever since. I think that's true. It there well there there's some validity to it too because the style of their music completely changed after sixty six. Mm -hmm. They went from "I want to hold your hand" to "Goo Goo Goo Goo," right. You know, I mean, well, that was partly let Ringo write stuff, too, but they well, completely they, uh, changed the style of music. Their, their conflicts also started after that, too. The right. internal conflicts of the band started after that point, too. Because mm -hmm. Paul was the glue that held them all together. Right. But And now the glue is gone and replaced by a substitute glue that's just not as strong. Right. And didn't get along with John. And I guess that wasn't that hard to do. <laughs> no. No. Yo, Yoko on you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, well, that's not the only one, though, that's like that. There's there's several more. Like, another one is Miley Cyrus was killed off by Nickel or by Disney when she was, when she was young on the show Hannah Montana, and she was having issues, so they ended up knocking her out replacing her with another one that looks just like her right well it also there was one on phil ensemble too from mm -hmm. pantera that he was in louisiana and thought he was shooting up heroin and shot up sugar or something like that and died oh that was like four or five years ago no it was before that it was, it was more like 10 years ago um but it was it had come up on facebook and I, I read, it was like a news article, professional, but it was just a hoax. 
Gotcha. But that's how people spread that shit. I mean, it's not hard to fake to get on Photoshop and shit like that and make something look like a newspaper article. Oh, exactly. Um, one of the another one. I mean, obviously, there's there's been lookalikes that have been used in multiple different. You know, uh, supposedly presidents have them. Dictators would have a lookalike, and supposedly we shot. Um, the 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 lookalike was the one that was killed in the bunker in forty or in forty four when Adolf Hitler took his own life. Supposedly that was supposedly the one was a lookalike, and it was also female. So it wasn't oh. him that was that was killed. It was one of his one of his stand-ins that it just happened to not be male at all. Right. But well, well, there's also a recent one too. Is that Marlena Trump is not the same Marlena Trump since the beginning of of his presidency? Melania or Marlena is whatever his wife is now. Melania. Okay, yeah. She is not the same as she was. That's a look like that we're seeing now. And nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the it the look alike urban myth has been I mean it's been around forever and it's like we talked about others where they're perpetuated by some form of truth where we know that dictators have used them in the past Castro used to use them Hitler used them uh Saddam Hussein used them you know I'm sure we have them for our presidents here but uh it, you know so when you start seeing you know, these other ones, it kind of gives them a little bit of life. Right. Yeah, they could just use Ronald McDonald to be the lookalike for our president. Or Oompa Loompa. Yep. Get old. Yeah, you know, and you remember when we were kids, it was nothing to pick up a hitchhiker. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, I did my parents, in high school. Yeah, my parents picked up hitchhikers all the time. But then you got all these hitchhiker urban legends that came out around that time too mm -hmm. yeah, which again grain of truth because people have you know hitchhikers have killed people that picked them up mm -hmm. you know raped or whatever um but it just comes down to common sense after a while it's like i ain't picking you up <laughs> I'm just going to drive on by. Sorry, you can catch the next car. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, and then in the late 70s, there was, there were, or in the 70s, I should say, there was movies like The Hitcher, mm -hmm. Hitchhiker, Chainsaw Massacre, the first one. They all involve picking up hitchhikers where shit goes bad. Yep. Yep. Well, and, I mean, it's just anymore. It's just common sense. You know, don't pick up a fucking hitchhiker. If you do, you deserve to die. Yeah. If if you see the car broke down and it's a mom carrying your car seat, then maybe you want to stop. Right. But if it's a six foot four man out in the middle of the out in the middle of nowhere with an axe that he's sharpening, just keep on going. Yeah, but I gotta say though, if it's a mom with a car seat, it it for me for me to stop, it, I better be able to see everything within like. Thousands of yards, no <laughs> trees or anything like that. <laughs> right. jump out of. Oh, and then like somebody jumps out. Yeah, you know, like. like you see them somewhere and see them, like. It has Okay. So apparently, don't pick up random little kids either. Or or babies crying outside your house. That's what it was. You hear babies crying outside your house. Oh, you'd hear a baby crying outside your house. You'd go oh. Out and then you get it. You go out to get it, then you get attacked. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yep. That's where well, just uh. That's why we all we all have these now. They're phones. Yep. And I, sometimes I forget that the it it is a phone and it actually calls people. And I yeah. can call people on the other end, which I forget that that's what it's for originally. But now it's it's a thing that I take pictures and I send them to people, and that's all I do with it. 
I just play games online. That too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and, and you know what my favorite urban legend is? What's that? The Pop Rocks and Coke. Oh, yes. Yeah, so supposedly if you eat Pop Rocks and drink Coke at the same time, it'll make your belly explode. Right. It It's not like, I'm sorry, Pop Rocks and Coke, even if you pour them together, it's just going to snap, crackle, and pop like a bowl of Rice Krispies. It is not Mentos and, and Diet Coke. Okay? Right. It's not going to erupt like that one. Now, I'm going to put this out there and um, – Again, if you're easily offended, you're not going to want to listen to this part. But um, Pop Rocks in a sexual oral situation is kind of fun. (laughs) (laughs) I was was just trying to word that in a way where maybe it wouldn't be as offensive, but it's offensive. (laughs) And I'm guessing that's both in a giving and a receiving so there you go. Uh, so next time you order from uh, from uh, you know uh, Adam and Eve, yep. Make sure you go to Dollar Tree and get some Pop Rocks too. Yeah, yeah. Because I'll yeah, put those in gels. Yeah, your belly will not explode. It's not <laughs> good for you. You'll get a sugar rush from hell. True. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so, let's see. What there's. Else we got? So going back to like some of the, uh, uh, we we're talking about some of the um, uh, medical ones. Yeah. Now, I'm arachnophobic. I fucking hate spiders. It's a sub- subconscious thing. It's a thing. I got bit by a spider when I was a little baby. My head grew, you know, pumpkin head style, just mm-hmm. grew big. And I've hated spiders my entire life. I understand their purpose. So before you fucking say some shit about the, you know, they killed the bugs. I know they killed the bugs. I like the spiders. And I know I'm never more than three feet away from a spider. And I know that myth too. So, but the one that <laughs> always creeped me out the most is lady gets a pop mark on her face. Oh. And she starts picking at it. And it grows, it gets bigger over, over the next couple of days and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So finally she goes to the doctor. It's like, doctor, what is this? And he lances it and out come just a shitload of my, my little spiders. It's like supposedly the spider laid eggs into her face or, yeah. or heard it in her ear, all this. And then little spiders come out of her head. <laughs> that one creeps me right the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that one. And, you know, but there's like another one is this lady goes into Burlington Coat Factory. Okay. She's trying on a coat. And, you know, it's got a hood on it. She gets a coat on. So she pulls the hood up and she feels this poke, like somebody, something poked her in the back of the neck. Hmm. Takes the coat off and she doesn't think of anything of it. She just kind of rubs it and then just puts the coat back and goes off somewhere else and then leaves. So later on, she's at home and all of a sudden she's like feverish and shit like that. So she goes and sees a doctor. And the doctor examines it, and she has also got a mark on her arm that she didn't notice. Same thing. And he's like, you've been bitten by a snake. And that's what caused this was the snake's venom. So she goes back to Burlington Coat Factory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, bitch, and wants to see the manager and chewing out the manager and stuff. And then she takes the manager over to the coat. And the manager's like, there's no snakes in our coats. They would not survive. And so she grabs a coat and, you know, as she grabs the coat, snakes start slithering out of it, drops the coat. <laughs> so, oh. yeah. But this was, again, on that show. Um, so that, after that, they bring in the CEO of Burlington Coat Factory, this lady who just sounded like a fucking idiot. <laughs> and she's like, our factories and our transportation – our climate control at 68 degrees and a snake could not survive in that. Bullshit. They, they don't move fast, but they can still survive. 68 degrees is not cold. No. And <laughs> the other thing about that too is a lot of reptiles can actually slow, they go into a hibernation mode. So yep. they pretty much go to sleep until it warms up. Right. And if they're cold, 
getting inside a cozy coat. Exactly. But keep them warm. I'm not saying that there's really a snake in the in the coat factory, but right. It, it it to me it just seemed like she was she was trying too hard to do damage control. <laughs> yeah, right. But you, instead of doing something that was she should have done was just made it into a commercial for Burlington Coat Factory. Hey, right. You know, come for the come for the snake, stay for the coats. Right. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So what other ones you got, Jason? So I love as as we all know, we we love the macabre and and you know we like weird shit. We like horror films. We like obviously we're doing urban legends, but one that I've I always found was this one's interesting. And it's it is an urban legend. All you have to do is look at your student guide, your student handbook to see that this one was, is bad. There's an urban legend where if your college roommate suffers death, suicide, accidental, you know, run over, whatever, if they perish within that school semester, you automatically, as the roommate, get a grieving mm -hmm. bonus of straight A's for the rest of the semester. So there was... Uh, there's the urban legend of the girl whose roommate after roommate after roommate kept dying until she got her degree. <laughs> Convenient. Right. But there's there no, they may give you a, uh, an incomplete for the class, but they're not just going to go ahead and hand you an A. Right. Right. Well, um, apparently, there, there's an urban legend about the uh, um, that's revolved around Disney, like Disneyland. Mm. Um, it's called Hooked, and it's basically um, it's the untold story of Disney's long Reuben villain theme park, Dark Kingdom Park. Mm. Um, so let me see what year this was written. This was written in 2017. Okay. So, article says, and I think it's a very long article, so I'll read it real quick. Three years ago, a Disney fan hoping for updates about a supposed all villains theme park that Disney would nestle alongside its other properties in Central Florida posted that inquiry to Reddit. In response, someone linked to an equally vague post on the WDW info webpage about Disney parks that were never built. More posts popped up in 2016, fueling the mystery. Earlier this year, another Reddit user linked to a post on the Berlin-based news and rumor site Movie Pilot, and just this June, the tourism site Travel Whip rubbed up the rumor. Again and again, the concept of a dark kingdom park was reiterated, and again and again, the response attracted believers and skeptics alike. Around and around, the discussion went like bad teacups and Dumbo the Flying Elephant rides at Disneyland. Every post devoted to the dark kingdom features the same basic skeleton. Disney had or has plans to carve out parts of its Walt Disney World complex to enhance the brand's rogues gallery. Instead of being re relegated to the parks, Halloween celebrations, villains like Ursula, Captain Hook, Maleficent, Gaston, the Evil Queen, and even Oogie Boogie from The Nightmare Before Christmas will get their chance to shine around in cool shows and attractions. Except this park never existed, not even in some rough conceptual form. As Disney historian Jim Hill told me, the idea of the Dark Kingdom seems to have basically come from the internet with no basis on anything concrete or, as one former Imagineer familiar with actual proposed projects and the online rumors put it, an entirely villain center park is complete bullshit. The story of the Dark King Kingdom isn't unfounded. Instead, the unlikely synthesis of hearsay, years of disparate and whole, wholly unrelated projects, snowballing half-truths, whispery rumors, and aggressive consumer product line that's captured imagination of acolytes and Disney's inability to formally comment on park plans in the legend's origin traces back to a single day in history, July 11th, 1986. Hey, that was my birthday! <laughs> nice. You know what? If they had one, I'd fucking go to it. I was just saying, it's like you know, you want to talk about wishful thinking. Yeah, that would. I think that would be great. It'd be fucking awesome. I that mean, park would be just as full as the rest of them. Yeah, it would because a lot of us like the villains. Exactly. Now there are a lot of other cool things about the Disney theme park. The the theme parks that in general that. It, that are actually kind of cool. Like one is there are fair, they, they release 
200 feral cats into Disneyland every night. Hmm? They eat the mice. Eat the mice. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. It's cheaper than having setting out traps and have to collect the traps so they wouldn't be out there. Uh, and we went we went there one time and one of the one of the kids that went with us actually took a picture of a cat in a tree in Disneyland, which is really? very rare to actually wow. be able to see them. Right. But then yeah, awesome. <laughs> there's there's other things like the the infamous Club Thirty Three. Hmm which is a, a club that's by New York Square. And supposedly there is a 10-year waiting list to get on to, to become a member of this place. And really? supposedly members of it are, you know, high society, the, like the, the, the Clintons and the, the Obamas and the Bush family. And then lots of members of, of uh, you know, Disney's inner circle and, and so supposedly it's like this, it's one of two places in Disneyland that you can actually order a drink. Right. But you can't get into it. You can find it if you know what you're looking for. Right. Well, um, this is one that I can't believe we haven't talked about yet. The babysitter and the telephone call that's coming from within the house. Yes. Yeah. As the story goes, it's, this girl is babysitting for this family. The family's out. You know, the mom and dad are out for the night. The kids, are, the kid is asleep in bed. And this is back during the time of landlines. And somebody calls. So she answers the phone. And they're like, do you know where the children are? Or some shit like that. Right. She's like, she just hangs up on him. And then he calls back, don't hang up on me. And. She keeps bugging her and she's getting freaked out so she calls the cops and you know then she get tells the cops what's going on then gets off the phone with the cops and then like five minutes later phone rings again and she's not sure who it is but she's called the cops so she's got to answer it so she answers it and it's the cops she's there they said that phone call is coming from within inside the house mm. <laughs> now here's where it gets fucked up even back with landline phones they could not trace. You cannot call a phone that you're on the same line with. Right. You couldn't, call up, you couldn't call downstairs if you were upstairs. Right. Yeah. Uh, it'd be like calling your own cell phone. Right. Which, I don't know. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can text myself, but I can't call myself. I don't even know if I can text myself. Never I tried text, it. I can text myself to tell myself to call myself, but then it doesn't work. So I email myself, hey, knock that shit off. Right. <laughs> but and, another one that I can't believe we didn't really talk about, it's kind of twofer. Uh, the Bloody Mary Candyman. They're both, oh, yeah. they're both um, urban legends where if you put yourself in a dark room, stand in front of a mirror with a candle, and say the name three times, like Beetlejuice, then the entity will come through there. Now, Candyman was, was basically uh, Clive Barker's version of the Bloody Mary myth. Right. But um, most people are a little bit more, some people might be more familiar with that version, but the Bloody Mary one was just this bloody entity would come and then they kill you because she lost her children years early right. at some point in time. I don't know when because we don't know when she she was alive. But that was that's another one of those right up there with a the hook man that pretty much everybody knows. Right. Well and another one is the choking Doberman. Well I don't think I know this one. Okay. So this lady comes home and she has a Doberman pincher and this was I believe back in this one originated back in the seventies or eighties because it always goes to the dog that is the guard, the typical, atypical guard dog at the time. Mm -hmm. So since then, it's morphed into pit bulls, Rottweilers, and shit like that. And, you know, back when we were kids, Dobermans were the scary dogs. <laughs> right. That was so, the pit bull of the generation. Right. So she comes home, and her dog is, like, choking, and she's, like, freaking out. She calls the vet, and the vet's like, oh, get him in here right, right, right away. So she rushes the vet the dog to the vet 
and they're like, oh, we're going to have to do surgery to open up our windpipes and stuff, so we'll call you when, you know, the, the puppy's ready or whatever. So she goes home. She's only, and well, it's on her, as she's driving home, they do the surgery, and they end up pulling out of the, the dog's throat three fingers, mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. human fingers. And so they call the lady, and she she's walking in the door. Ray has the phone rings, of course. <laughs> and they're like, um, there was three fingers in the dog's throat. That's what was choking her. And so whatever is missing those fingers is probably still there. So she calls the police. Mm -hmm. The police come over, and they're going throughout the whole house. And the only they get to the only door that's closed is some closet. They open up the door, and there's an intruder there holding his hand, and he's got three fingers missing. Oh, wow. Okay, here's where a lot of the holes come in. For mm -hmm. one, the dog was choking on that, and you're trying to take it to a vet. Is it going to survive long enough? Right. Two, where's the blood trail? Right. Three, where's the blood around the dog's mouth? Right. Because my dog caught a possum a couple weeks ago, and she had blood all over the place. Oh, <laughs> so you know it's it just doesn't add up i mean you came home and your dog's choking and you would see the blood around his mouth because if, if you bite somebody's fingers off they're gonna bleed like a motherfucker and they're also gonna make noise yeah you lose three fingers and you're not gonna you're not just gonna sit there and go well it was me waiting for well, you they could, they could go into shock yeah, yeah you know from blood loss or whatever but still right yeah but, yeah, that's a popular myth, too. Then there's the myth of the licked hand. Oh, I just saw that. What did, I never heard of this one. So what, what the story goes is uh, there's two versions of it. There's a little girl or an older older woman. Now, uh, I'm going to say little girl, okay? So a little girl is at home alone, and she hears a commotion downstairs. So she runs upstairs to get away from it and hide. And while she's while she's in her bed... She hears her dog under her bed. So she puts her hand down, down on the side of the bed, and the dog's licking her hand. So she's getting, feel, feels really, really safe and secure. So now she's calmed down to the point where she feels like she needs to go investigate what the noise was. So when she goes back downstairs, she sees her dog dead and a message written in the dog's blood that says humans can lick hands too. Oh, that one's creepy. I go get chills. <laughs> right. I like that one. Uh, what about the killer in the back seat? There's a yeah. Go for it. All right. So, and of course, it's a lady, as it always is. Mm -hmm. So this lady's driving home. Let's say, so she's going down the road, and then this truck comes up behind her. And this truck is following her and hitting its horn and signaling to her and has this bright lights on. And she's freaked out because she's by herself. So she's just trying, she's just racing home to get away from this truck. And on her way, she sees a police station. So she pulls into the police station and trying to get out of her car, gets out of her car, you know, trying to get up, get, go into the police station before the guy in the truck gets up and gets her. And as he's rushing towards her, she's screaming, no, no, leave me alone, help, please. And instead of going after her, he opens up her back door, and there's a guy in the back seat with a knife. <laughs> so apparently, he had come up behind her as the killer was going to to kill her with the knife, and flashed his brights and stuff, scared him, so he hid down in the seat. Mm -hmm. But again, there's so many different variations of that. Uh, right. You know, it's just, it's just, again. Shit like that can happen, so let's take it, twist it, and warp it. And and to me, I I'm glad that you you went there with it because to me that is, look, we 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 mentioned multiple times already. All of these are grounded somewhere in truth. It's just that slight little twist that makes makes these different stories go from, eh, or side story news stories to something that's like holy. Fuck, that's crazy. Right. And see, and the hole in this story is if you were a killer and you're in the backseat of somebody's vehicle and you're going to kill them, 
wouldn't you wait till they stopped? Yeah. Not while they're driving, because then, then you're going to die, too. See, like in the movie The Dark Knight, when Two-Face is in the backseat of the limo, and he tells Maroney that you're okay, you're going to live, but I don't know about him, and he says, who's him? And he puts on his seatbelt and then shoots the driver. Right. Put the seatbelt on first. Mm-hmm. Then shot him. You don't put a seatbelt on and then stab somebody. Right. It's impossible. It, you can't read that. It doesn't, I mean... I mean, it may not be impossible. It's just not very practical. Right. In yeah. your chances of survival, unless it was a murder-suicide and you just want to be death by car accident. <laughs> right. But other than that. Uh, oh, well, and the, not only that, I mean, you, you take the risk of not dying and being, like, more wounded, something that's going to last forever, like, you know, um, like, handicapped or shit like that you know being paraplegic or paralyzed or whatever yeah i mean a person that wants to kill somebody is doing it for the for the um the sensation they get from the kill Mm -hmm. they're not doing it to die themselves no (laughs) especially psycho killers you know the the one in the movies there it's all about the hunt and the yep. game and the the feeling it's not just i'm going to do this one random act and that's you know i'm going to call it quits right that's not how that shit works no they're going on a spree i want to kill everybody oh you motherfuckers got to die <laughs> <laughs> but but the where i think where we were going with all that is it it's the same thing that happens with a, a good horror movie yeah. Or you take a very simple concept and then you you tweak it just slightly to make it go from uh to what the fuck. Right. Right. And you know who are the masters of these? What's that? Japanese people. You know how many movies that we have where we've changed where we have redone their movies? Mm-hmm. I mean the oh. grudge, the ring. You know, they're just to name a couple. Yeah, I mean, they have a ton of urban legends. I mean, you just named two of them, The Grudge, The Ring. Those are urban legends that they turned into films. Yes. You know, The Suicide Forest and stuff like that, which yeah. there's truth to, you know? But, yeah, lots and lots of shit. You know, it's creepy. Because they have a lot of, a lot of customs that, yeah. to us, just seem kind of... Um, you know, well, obviously they're foreign, but a lot of their customs are rooted in, in, uh, you know, in ancient beliefs where, you know, you, they, they think, uh, you know, in terms of karma and, um, honor, Mm -hmm. if you, you know, you, you lose your honor, then you have to regain it by, you know, you know, killing yourself. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, um, tradition that goes with with the japanese that a lot of people are just fascinated and fixated on like the the shoguns and the the samurai right and the ninja you know the stealth of the ninja which right that's an urban legend right there where we think of the ninja like storm shadow all white you know or you know then there's the black ninjas that have you know head to toe black but in reality the ninja dress like everybody else so that they can blend in if right. you're wearing a fucking mask and all white suit with two swords strapped to your back, you're going to stand out. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Well, I mean, we've also got the death car. Mm-hmm. Which, um, this one actually, there was a case of it in Michigan where this guy bought this old Cadillac and um. And this is an older gentleman, did he? Bought it from a farmhouse and gets it home. It's beat up, so he's he's rebuilding it and bringing it back. Mm-hmm. Well, when he gets to the interior, he notices blood stains on the floor panel and in the cushions and stuff. So somebody had been killed in the front seat of the car. Oh, wow. And so when he start, starts doing some research on it, because this was years after he bought the car when he finally got to the restoration aspect of it and was doing that. And 
he tried contacting the previous owners, but they had already they had passed away, and so he had gotten some people. That, he'd gotten a hold of um, the FBI and the police because of the blood stains and stuff, and so they did a background check on the car to see who owned it previously, and there was no registered owners before him. Mm. So yeah, it's just one of those weird things, and then you know other people will buy a car, and then. You know, they'll bite in the winter, then summertime comes, and there'll be the smell that they can't seem to get rid of, and they can't, and it's just it's disgusting. They go back to the owner going, what happened? Oh, my my father-in-law died in this car on the side of the road. He had a heart attack. He pulled over to the side, and he was dead for like two weeks before somebody found him. <laughs> well, and there's also the legend of the cursed Porsche. Hmm, I don't know that one. So... The, the legend of the cursed Porsche is James Dean buys this this Porsche. The legendary actor James Dean, which oh, yeah. legendary for three movies. That's yeah. three movies in two years, which is okay. Anyway, so he was notorious for like he, he liked to live on the on the wild side, I guess. You know, he was a he was a risk taker. So he was he, he buys this Porsche, drive along wraps it around a telephone pole, he dies. So the car itself was purchased by somebody from the yard, restored, that owner wrecks the car, dies. So after that, they take the car, they put it in a museum, or on its way to the museum, it, on the supports that it's in, where they're trying to put it up on a display, Sports give out, the car falls, crushes a man to death. Jesus Christ. So there's multiple deaths that happened around this car even after it killed James Dean. Right. So, you know, there's, so there's, there's urban legends and there's just strange fucking coincidences that turn right. into urban legends. Well, and about 10 or 15 years ago, I remember hearing one where, because... I was driving. I, I don't remember who was with me, but I was driving in town here, and it was night, and there was a vehicle going the opposite way with no headlights on. So I flashed them, you mm -hmm. know, flashed my brights at them, because, you know, you tell them, hey, turn your fucking lights on, dipshit. And the person with me is like, oh, don't do that. I'm like, why? Oh, because gang members are driving around without headlights on. When somebody flashes them, they follow them home and kill them. It's initiation right. I'm like, oh, fuck off. That's so stupid. Right. And that one just got life like a year ago because I remember actually hearing that on on the radio talking about that. Ugh. And I'm like, like, wait, that sounds vaguely familiar. Like that whole thing went through like years ago. Like it yeah. finally hit the gang members. I'm like, you know what? That's not a half bad idea. Right. We got to start trying that one. Yeah. Or uh, the urban legend of Coca-Cola. Um, making Fanta to sell in Nazi Germany without public backlash. Right. It originally has the actual tale of German Max Keith who invented the drink and ran Coca-Cola's operations in Germany during World War II. Yes. Uh, Max actually, so that's, that's kind of funny because they couldn't get all the stuff needed to continue to make Coca-Cola over there. So he created his own Coca-Cola that was flavored and that was Fanta. Right. right. You, but there's other there's other uh so people yes people still drink fanta today and yes it was created by a nazi that part's not that part's not disputed there's another thing that's not disputed is adidas and puma were were created by two nazi brothers mm -hmm. and they divided an entire town where half the town worked at the adidas factory the other half worked at the puma factory and to this day it's like right Twix, left Twix. You don't intermix with the others. <laughs> they integrated themselves over clothing apparel mm. that uh, was all created by Nazis. Yep. And then, well, it, well, real quick about there's there's urban myths about the um, experiments that the Nazis did, but more importantly, there's there's experiments about what the Russians did. Now the right. Russians tried to create a race of super soldiers where they mixed human DNA with gorilla DNA to create mm. this 
super strong but loyal net race of of humans and what they really got was nothing because it doesn't work you can't mix species like that right especially in in the 40s right well and you know everybody's always you know there's always those tales and they they stem from like science fiction or comic books and shit like that where they're trying to create this super soldier and da 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 which you know I'm sure people are there are people trying to develop super soldiers but they mm-hmm. haven't figured it out yet right <laughs> yeah yeah, and like the term urban, le- urban legend um, first appeared in print in 1968 by Jan Harold Brunvard, professor of English at the University of Utah. Mm-hmm. He introduced the term to the general public in a series of popular books published beginning in 1981. Yeah. Like one of the ones is The Vanishing Hitchhiker, where somebody picks up a hitchhiker and they're sitting there talking to him and they're watching the road. And then. And- they just disappear. Poof. Yep. Without a trace. There's, yeah, it, well, I love, I love urban legends and I love a lot of this stuff because just like conspiracy theory, they always inspire conversation. Oh yeah. And that's oh, why yeah. I really like conspiracy theories a lot too. Not that I believe all of them. I mean, there's some that I do, but same with urban legends. There's some that, I really like, and then some I think are just really stupid. Right. Especially yeah. like when you break it down, like the calls coming from upstairs. What do yeah. you, you have a different phone? Right. You know, so or, yeah, or the killer try to kill somebody while they're driving, or right. you know, dog biting out the fingers, but no blood trail or anything like that. I mean, some of those are are pretty dumb, but then you get into like the supernatural ones that i think are kind of kind of interesting the oh yeah the black eyed kids the, the you know i you know there's obviously urban legends about aliens which yep. we've covered in other podcasts but it it's just a fun topic so if you if you like this you know research it more yeah check it out i mean there's lots of stuff and I'm, everybody's heard them you know they people call them by different things but you, you've heard them. I mean, you've heard some variation of the story before at some point in your life. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible to go through life without hearing some of these stories. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hell, who knows? You even made up one of these stories. Right. I know I tried. Yep. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> but yeah, and if you're ever in Alabama, go check out the Dead Children's Playground. <laughs> All right. Tell me about the Dead Children in the Playground. <laughs> Why it's creepy. This eerie playground adjacent to Maple Hill, Huntsville's oldest cemetery, doesn't just have an eerie nickname for fun. The playground was presumably designed to entertain kids while their parents visited the graves of loved ones. Yeah, because that's what I want to do. I'm going to go hang out on the swings while mom and dad go visit the graves. Right. Legend has it, though, that the spirits of children who've been buried in the cemetery since the first grave was dug there in 1822 come out to play at night. The living have observed orbs of light going down the slide, seen swings moving on their own, and even heard giggling. Creepers still, some say the spirits include victims of a rash of child murders that happened in the 60s, when bodies were rumored to have been found in the area that now houses the playground. Where it came from, the playground itself wasn't open until 1985, so you can imagine how much pent-up energy the tiny spirits had after 163 years without a slide. 2007, the city tried to raise the park to make more room for graves, and remove the slides and swings overnight. After the public outcry, it was replaced with more modern equipment, making it slightly less, less creepy to look at, and also probably resulting in some happier ghosts. Because, you know, wind will not make a swing go on by itself. Right. Never seen that before. Nope. Nope. Okay, the giggling. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a little weird. Yep. But <laughs> ain't no, it's, it's weird, too, because I, I just kind of want to bring this up. And this is going to make me sound a little crazy, but I'm okay with that. There's certain cemeteries you go into, and they just feel peaceful. There's certain cemeteries you go into, and they have this dark, brooding feeling to them. Mm, mm -hmm. And for me, it's those, and I can kind of pinpoint the area, and I won't go near that area. But, but you know, you you know the the cemetery behind the Island Park here? Yes. 
We used that to was, when we were kids. Yeah, that was the most peaceful cemetery I've ever been in. I go in there and just check out all the gravestones, the mausoleums, sitting there and write or draw and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's just peaceful. But the one my mom's buried at, right in the back there, there's this dark, ominous feeling to it, even during the day that I don't want to go near. Oh, weird. You know, I've had that feeling in, in a couple cemeteries going to where you just go the farther you get back to the older part and then there's just a, an unease, an unrest. Mm -hmm. Almost like the temperature drops. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of spooky, but that's where I like to take pictures. Yeah. So have you ever had anything interesting pop up in the pictures? No, no, I can't say I have. No orbs or anything like that? No, no, unfortunately, no. I've had, you know, I've had more experiences with orbs and stuff, you know, here at my house. Right. Than I have, and I have one, this weird, so speaking, while we're talking about this, um, there's this one section of my house where, uh, we'll, you know, every house will get, a, get flies in it. But this one, like four or five flies will just circle in a, in the same spot in in my house it's like in the middle of a, of a dining room weird yeah just in the same spot all the time it's for years it's been that huh. it's either some kind of man, magnetic anomaly right there or there's something buried under the house at that particular spot right right yeah that's that's weird that is really weird it kind of freaked me out a little bit <laughs> it doesn't doesn't like no, the dogs aren't affected by that spot or anything, so they don't avoid it. They don't, you know, they don't notice it, but it's just flies in that one spot all the time. Hmm. That's odd. Well, this one's been kind of a kind of a shorter one for us. A little shorter, yeah. We've had a few, few just over an hour. Yep. So I guess to sum up today's episode tonight, Uh oh. Hello, hello. Are you there? Are you there? You're not moving, but I can't hear anything. This is a bummer. <laughs>